We must move on now to questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And can I inform members that questions 4 and 11 have been withdrawn? And I call Mr. Ross Hussey. Mr. Hussey. Question 1, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. It was, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it was clearly established in court that the equal pay settlement only applied to periods of service in the Northern Ireland Civil Service and did not apply to bodies such as the NIO and PSNI. So there is no valid equal pay claim. However, I am aware how strongly affected staff feel about this issue, and I have worked to find a way in which the moral argument that has been raised could be recognised in some way. As a consequence of this work, I have recently circulated a paper to my executive colleagues outlining a recommendation that will result, I hope, in a satisfactory resolution of the issue for this group of staff. The recommendation in any expenditure will require the agreement of the executive. For supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Unfortunately, I didn't quite hear the, the full response from the Minister, but I want to ask the question, uh, is, he, is he aware that the, the, the rumour is that the, the proposal from the Minister has been put forward to the Executive and he has said that it will take weeks uh, to get through the Executive? Do we have a rough indication of when he expects this matter to be resolved? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member, I'm sure, wouldn't expect me to operate on the basis of rumours. Um, all that I can say to the member, uh, to the House, and more importantly to those uh, affected members of staff is that uh, in respect of the, the work that I need to do in terms of putting forward a solution, or a suggested solution as it is at this stage, to executive colleagues, I have done that. Um, uh, the paper has been with uh, the executive now for a number of weeks. Um, I can understand the frustrations that some members of staff will, will be experiencing because of what they perceive as uh, yet further delay in resolving this issue. Um, I have done my bit, as I said, I have drafted a solution. It has circulated around executive colleagues. Uh, I await agreement of executive colleagues for that to come forward for debate and discussion at the executive and hopefully uh, agreement to the solution that I have put forward. In terms of estimating uh, how long that will take, uh, I would point out to the member that, um, whilst I would hope, uh, and indeed I think that it should be something that should be resolved as a matter of urgency, given the widespread support that there supposedly has been for a resolution um, over the last number of months, uh, I would expect that it should be dealt with and dealt with fairly quickly. Uh, but as the member will appreciate, uh, not everything moves quickly through the as quickly through the executive as we would like it to, to be. Uh, and in that respect, um, uh, I can't put. Even if I wanted to or was able to, I can't put a, um, a, clear, a clear guess or a clear estimate on when it might come forward for agreement, but I hope that it does very soon. I call Mr Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Princ Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, can he clarify to the House that all groups, including home civil servants at AA and AO grade, have been consulted and have agreed to any proposed settlement? Uh, I'm not going to Mr. Deputy Speaker, get into the detail of what has been put forward in the paper. It is still a matter of um, confidence between myself and executive colleagues as to what is in the paper, what detail it includes within it. Um, there has been no um, consultation, to use his word, um, about the specific paper that has gone forward, other than I have to say I have listened very, very carefully to representations made by, for example, members of this House uh, on behalf of affected staff. I have received much correspondence from affected staff since taking up post back in um, late July of last year. Um, so in that sense, I have been listening constantly to representations about the need to deal with this issue, uh, to deal with it conclusively, to deal with it in a way that, whilst there may not be, as I mentioned previously and I have mentioned before in this House, a legal argument for dealing with this issue. But recognises the moral argument, the very strong moral argument that has been put forward. Uh, and I hope that, that what is there in respect of a suggested solution not only meets with favour in terms of executive colleagues, but is also something that will be welcomed by those affected staff uh, and will draw a line under this issue. I call Mr Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers uh, so far. Minister, you have indicated that you have submitted a, a paper for the consideration of your executive colleagues. Could you indicate to the House um, what the extent of the support has been or not been 
uh, from your executive colleagues thus far? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have received responses uh, to my paper from, from roughly half of, of, of the executive. So I have received responses from ministers uh, representing our own party, uh, the Alliance Party, the Ulster Unionist Party and the SDLP. And, and whilst many of the responses have highlighted issues around um, the detail of the paper, which I am actually very welcoming of, I think it is important that um, executive colleagues feed back any uh, concerns that perhaps have been uh, represented to them by uh, affected staff, um, and they seek clarification in respect of how any, any scheme might, might work. I think that is something, something to be welcomed and is a positive response. So it's ranged from sort of the responses have ranged from inquiries of that nature up to outright enthusiasm for the suggested solution that I have put forward. To date, I have received no responses from ministers uh, representing departments where Sinn Féin ministers are, are in charge. So I am, as of yet, uh, con uh, unsure what their position is. I do, though, um, I do, though, seek some solace in the fact that um, members of that party, particularly those on the Finance and Personnel Com uh, Committee, where this issue has been voiced most strongly over the last year, 18 months and, and beyond, have been supportive of a solution. And, and I hope that their support rubs off on their ministerial colleagues and they come forward with support for the solution that I have put to the executive. Mr. Phil Flanagan. I get the, a free or last concordant as a, a member of the Finance and Personnel Committee. I'll certainly not speak on your behalf. Um, can I thank the, the Minister for his replies? And, and, and I'm sure he's aware that there are a large number of retired civil, ser civil servants who are very disgruntled um, that this settlement is a belated response um, who, for people who were, throughout their careers were discriminated against and who are still awaiting for justice. But can I ask the Minister to clarify whether the paper he has submitted solely deals with those in the PSNI and the NIO or whether it um, also includes that small number of workers within NI Water who are in a very similar situation? Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the paper that is before the executive deals exclusively with the issue in respect of uh, PSNI and NI for my NIO staff. Uh, it does not deal with the NI Water situation. That is a matter for the Minister for Regional Development to deal with. Um, and, you know, I think that um, I am very keen to see this resolved, very keen to see it resolved as quickly as possible. I made the commitment um, two members of, of staff, affected staff, way back uh, early on in my tenure in office that I would reopen this issue. I would take a look at it again. I think I owed them that at the very least. Uh, I have been able to find a, a, a way which I think can resolve this issue satisfactorily. And I hope that the member, having been brave enough to, to, to rise and ask the question, can I import upon his party colleagues, uh, those who are in the executive, the importance of recognising the very points that the member has made in respect of the moral argument that something has to be done in respect of the staff who have been affected, that they too come forward with their support, uh, and that that support is not only forthcoming but forthcoming in a, in a rapid fashion, so that this issue can be dealt with and dealt with conclusively. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Knows how perplexing this matter has been for the affected staff and the inordinate delay. Do I discern from what the minister said that whereas he has proffered a paper to the executive, it has so far been blocked from being tabled for discussion by Sinn Féin? the party that likes to talk the most about equality in this House, and this is an equality issue. Uh, is the Minister gently saying to us that expectations, for example, that this might have been dealt with in the June monitoring round are now to be dashed because of that obstruction? Well, the member is always less gentle than, than I would be in, in use of, of terminology. That is something I pride myself on. Um, uh, it is, it is not right to conclude that this could not be dealt with in the June monitoring round. It, it, it could still be dealt with uh, the June monitoring round in terms of submissions of bids by departments only concluded at the tail end of last week. Deputy Speaker, it has yet to be deliberated on by the executive. I hope to do that at our next meeting, which I think is scheduled for about 10 days' time. So there is, a distinct, you know, there is the possibility, I suppose, but no more strongly than that, that this could be dealt with at that point. But of course, as the member has rightly identified, and as he would understand and appreciate, it does require, because there would be an expenditure element to it, uh, and the proposal that I have put forward um, would require a considerable amount of expenditure, which would have to happen as well, I have to say, within a, a tight monetary and budgetary context as well. Um, it will require the agreement of all sides and all parts of the executive to do that. I would not be pessimistic in terms of, you know, I think that the fact that every party in this House has come forward with support for a resolution to this problem bodes well for agreement at executive level now that there is a viable solution put 
before them. Uh, so I remain optimistic that this can be agreed, uh, and I would share the member, and indeed I'm sure the rest of the House's hope, that this could be resolved as in the sort of short timetable that the member has spoken about. Thank you. And I call Ms. Michelle McElveen. Question to you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, whilst public services must operate as efficiently as possible, public sector reform is not all about cost containment. Upfront investment may be necessary to stimulate innovation in service delivery, uh, to improve outcomes for citizens, and to generate savings. My public sector reform division within my department is currently exploring potential financial incentives that may be useful in progressing reform initiatives, and this could indeed include invest to save measures. For example, I believe that a greater focus on preventative spending is key to encouraging innovation in our public services. Invest to save measures could provide the financial stimulus required to encourage preventative spending. Michael Veen for supplementary. Thank you, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. Further to that, could I ask the Minister which invest to save measures are being considered? Well, the Public Sector Reform Division within the Department is currently uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, exploring possible sources of funding to support uh, a range of, of reform initiatives, and these include the potential to establish a uh, specific change fund. Uh, it would be envisaged that a change fund would be based upon um, invest to save principles which have been well established in, in Northern Ireland over the last number of years and would be available to finance upfront investment and cross-cutting initiatives that are expected to generate savings in the longer term. It is also envisaged that a change fund would be available to finance some of the innovative methodologies such as the innovation laboratories that, that we have commenced to develop solutions to complex policy issues. And I would anticipate that the fund will be in place for 2015-16, so that's the next financial year. However, given that discussions are at a very early stage in respect of next year's budget, it is not yet clear what quantum expenditure would be required. Well, Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer. Would the Minister agree with me that nowhere in Northern Ireland are public sector workers more demoralised at this point in time than in cold rain? And can the Minister assure us that this is just not another device, homespun, uh, to rob areas of Northern Ireland of public service jobs when the private sector is nowhere ready to absorb them. In, in, uh, in framing that question, I, I, I presume that the member is, is suggesting that reform of the public sector isn't some sort of code for reductions in, in, in headcount. I've been very. Um, I hope I've picked them up correctly in that respect. Um, um, he is wrong if he is suggesting that that is the underlying ethos behind reform of the public sector. Uh, I have been pushing this issue really since the, the, the start of my term in office, um, recognising as I do, and it, well, this, this is something that will become crystal clear and more than apparent to members in this House if it already has not over the next number of weeks and months as we start to not only conclude the um, budget for 14-15 as we are taking through the, the budget bill both uh, today and tomorrow, but as we start to develop the budget for 15-16 it will become crystal clear to members of this House and the people outside that the money that we had to spend on public services is decreasing in real terms as we move forward. And that is going to put severe pressure on services and the services that people in Northern Ireland rely upon. I have never, uh, right from the outset, suggested that this is in any way code for reforming the public sector's code for reducing the headcount. That's not something that I see as, a, a, um, as part of the agenda. It is instead about getting better outcomes with the resources that we have, or in fact actually with lesser outcomes. So it's about improving how we do business, it's about changing how we do business, it's about looking at and learning from others uh, in terms of innovative methodologies and methods of delivering public services, not being afraid to say that we are not, we are not r perfect at everything in Northern Ireland and that there are others who do things perfectly well, if not better as well, uh, and, and learning from them and applying those methods to Northern Ireland. So this is about using the staff that we have within the public service in Northern Ireland, some very gifted, very talented, very able staff located right across Northern Ireland, and getting better outcomes for them, from, from them for the work that they, they do. That's something that I want to see happen as a matter of urgency because of the underlying problems that we have with public spending moving forward. Thank you. And I call Mr Stephen Mutry. Question number three. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Public infrastructure projects are critical in helping to underpin the economic growth of Northern Ireland. It is important that they are delivered expeditiously. The potential for improvement in the commissioning and delivery of public infrastructure projects was recently examined by a number of reports, including one from the CBI. As Chair of the Procurement Board, I established a subgroup 
to bring forward recommendations to improve government's performance and to draw up an action plan for implementation. This work is now complete and will be considered by the Procurement Board later this week. Having now considered feedback from the subgroup, I intend to endorse the following key recommendations, among others. That a, firstly, that a centralised construction procurement and delivery service is established within uh, Central Procurement Directorate in my department to be responsible for the provision of technical advice, procurement, project management and contract management relating to all government building projects. That the Executive agrees to a portfolio of strategically significant projects based on recommendations from my department and the Strategic Investment Board. This will follow a zero-based review of the priorities for infrastructure investments. That projects are re reviewed on a quarterly basis to enable ministers to report on the progress of those that are of strategic importance. That departments fully populate the uh, ISNI delivery tracking system to enable the information it contains to form a regional infrastructure plan, improving the visibility of forthcoming projects to the local construction industry and that the Head of the Civil Service and Permanent Secretaries implement a change programme to support a delivery-focused culture within government. For supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. In his answer, the Minister mentioned his hope for a more centralised uh, procurement and delivery service within CPD. Has he been able to make any progress to date in this regard? Have, um, the Health Minister and I, for, for example, have uh, recently agreed that the functions of the Health Estates Investment Group will be transferred from the Department of Health to Central Procurement Directorate in, in the Department of Finance and Personnel. Um, as a material result of that, around 50 staff will transfer to CPD in October of, of 2014. Um, how that will then work in practice in, in respect of having a more centralised approach to procurement and delivery is that the benefits of having um, centralisation, of having the shared experience that will become from CPD joining with, in effect, health estates will become quite apparent very quickly. Uh, those individuals, Mr Deputy Speaker, will be responsible for uh, specific technical advice. They will be responsible for the actual procurement and they will be responsible for project and contract management. Responsibility for the prioritisation and ordering of um, health infrastructure projects will still reside and remain with the Department of Health, Social Services and, and Public Safety. Uh, they will also be responsible for the financing of those projects. Uh, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that sort of approach that the Health Minister and I have agreed to in respect of health estates is for me the way ahead in terms of meeting that objective of having a more centralised procurement and delivery service within CPD, where the parent department still decides what the priorities are in terms of infrastructure. So, in health case, it decides where a uh, hospital service will be provided or a primary care centre will be provided. It is then the responsibility of CPD within my department to ensure that that is delivered on time and delivered up to specification and, to deliver, and delivered within budget. So the responsibility of that is taken away from the health department, and it does what it does best, which is deliver the service that flows from that. It is my department's responsibility to make sure that the infrastructure is put in place and put in place in a timely manner. I think that's the way ahead. I think that um, it is a template which I hope other ministers within the executive will follow and that they too will see the benefits of that type of approach. Mr. Patsy McLuhan. Uh, Gurma, I've got a free last on Coyle. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I guess Muiha Slation Eiras and Regra Krimsia Kamai, and I thank the Minister for uh, his wide ranging, comprehensive uh, reply there, particularly on procurement issues. Uh, <clears throat> specifically, with regard to sign off for either major capital schemes or indeed further investment infrastructural schemes, uh, could the Minister provide us with some detail how many of those schemes rest at his department? Currently, for sign off? I, I wouldn't have the precise number of, of, of projects that are sitting before my department waiting sign off in terms, terms of, particularly, he, he's talking, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about business cases that other departments have put forward to, to DFP for, for their sign off. Um, certainly, do our best to provide that uh, to the member as, as quickly as, as possible. Um, it, the, the whole issue of business cases is something that. that I'm mindful of the criticism of the Department of Finance and Personnel, criticism which I don't always think is warranted. I think that the criticism is sometimes it's convenient to criticise DFP for slowing down uh, projects because they're sitting on business cases. I've found in the past, through experience, that often uh, the business cases haven't even arrived at DFP, yet we're already being blamed for, for slowing it up. Um, I, don't mean being, I don't mind being blamed if we have slowed it up, but if we haven't even got the paper yet, it's hard for us to slow it up. Um, we have done some analysis within the department. We have found that, in actual fact, we are turning business cases around 
um, within a very within short order. I can't remember the precise number of days, but it's not weeks and weeks and weeks as some might think that it is. Um, we have also looked at, and part of the work that this uh, procurement subgroup has been looking at, raising the, the delegated levels, so that departments can uh, will have to take some responsibility themselves. I think one of the other things with business cases that happens from time to time is that um, departments pass them on to the FP, almost expecting us to mark their homework for them, and they need to take some of the responsibility themselves and to take a judgment. They're looking for us to judge for us to sit in judgment over the project and the merits of a scheme, I think it's, it's important that departments start to do that more themselves. And so one of the things that we'll be looking at is, can we increase the current delegated limit, which I think is a million pounds, and increase that perhaps to, to two million um, for all business cases? So I'm mindful of the criticism that is there. It's something that we haven't turned a blind eye to, that we've sought to address. I don't think all of the blame is ours. In fact, I don't think even the majority of the blame is ours. Um, but hopefully the work of the procurement subgroup and the recommendations that come forward get endorsement from the whole per, uh, procurement board and are taken forward and we see even swifter uh, turnaround of business cases, whether they prefer infrastructure projects or not. Thank you. Sir, no, just remind of the team on the and Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, certainly good news that the Minister brings today. I wonder, Minister, could you tell me what progress has been made uh, about fast-tracking other projects which can be substituted at short notice should a particular project not go ahead? I, I think that that's incredibly important. And you, you can get the, um, the procurement and delivery vehicles that we speak are in place as best you can. You can, you can do that. that, that uh, and with the, the, the merger of health estates into uh, CPD, that's a major step forward in respect of doing that. But the member is right. You need a, uh, a pipeline, to use a sort of vernacular within the, the construction industry, of projects that are ready to go. Um, in the best of times and indeed in the worst of times, and he sort of identifying the worst of times in respect of, um, say, projects, major projects that don't go, go ahead, like the A5, for example, and the urgency that there is for the executive to find projects. We will have something akin to that type of situation, I imagine, in June monitoring, as there will be early on in the financial year, as always is the case, I think, in around June monitoring, capital projects that, that departments identify capital projects that can't go forward, they relinquish that cash pretty early. It's then up to the executive then to find other projects that are worthwhile spending that money on. And as a member will appreciate in the House, I'm sure will understand, it isn't always easy to bring forward major projects. You just don't simply simply don't have the time to do that. So one of the, the key recommendations that I'm endorsing is that the executive as a whole agrees a portfolio of strategically significant infrastructure projects for Northern Ireland so that when we get to budgets, when we get to in-year monitoring, um, whenever situations arise, um, such as the A5, which unfortunately arise from time to time, it's just a reality of the type of projects that they are, we can pluck those strategically important projects off that list and move them forward much more quickly than previously would have been the case. Thank you. And I call Mr. Mickey Brady. Chair Severick, Craig, question five. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The executive's decisions on allocations during the monitoring rounds are based on a number of factors, not least the amount of resources available. When departments submit monitoring bids, they provide a range of information, including how the proposal will impact on departmental objectives and the programme for government. Departments are also asked to rank their individual bids. All of these factors are taken into account in the executive's monitoring round decision making. I thank the Minister for his answers. Could I ask the Minister what protections are in place to ensure that allocations are made on the basis of evidence-based need? There, there is a, a considerable amount of work um, goes into analysing exactly the need of, 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 of each bid that comes forward from departments. And departments are given a, when I, was, I mentioned previously in response to an earlier question, that Departments are given a period of time to come forward with um, their own priorities. They are, in some respects, responsible for ranking those priorities themselves in respect of actual need for the project. Um, but, you know, as the member will appreciate, there is always more uh, bid for than there is available resources for. Um, so other factors have to sometimes come into the place whether what the quantum of resources are available even to meet a, a bid which there might be pretty acute need for. So sometimes you will see, and, and, and I imagine that June will be no different, although I don't anticipate there will be much cash available in June, but in June you will see bids that will be partially met 
and not completely met because the executive will want to try to meet something of quite a few things rather than all of one bid. And of course, there is a, an important factor too in respect of the ability for each department to deliver on what it is requesting in year. And there may well be a need, um, but the quantum of resources that they are looking for may not be able to be spent within the year. Now, usually that isn't a problem in June, but it becomes increasingly a problem in October and certainly is in January as the financial year is running down and the ability to spend large amounts of money uh, diminishes. Mr Sidney Anderson. I thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response. But can I ask the Minister to outline to the House uh, what pressures the budget is facing in the current June monitoring round? As, as, as I said, uh, in response to Mr, Mr Brady uh, and, and to pre previous questioners as well, that, um, the budget, as the um, member will appreciate, is under increasing pressure. And I, um, the June monitoring round process in terms of departments bidding to the Department of Finance and Personnel and listening and ranking all of their bids has just concluded. Uh, that is being analysed and, and we hope to be in a position to agree um, or certainly to put something to the executive by its next meeting in a, in a week or so's time. Uh, and I, can't, I can't give specifics on, on the bids and, and as much as the member in the House might like me to do that, I can't, I can't do that. Um, um, and the process, as I say, has just concluded. Um, we are looking at those bids. We will come forward to the executive with our recommendations in terms of how those bids can or cannot be met. Um, but the one thing that I can say without getting into the specifics is that I know that June, in June monitoring, as indeed the whole budget moving forward, is going to be immensely challenging. It isn't helped, I have to say, um, Deputy Speaker, by the fact that there is still no agreement to proceed with uh, welfare reform. And that this year alone, and in, uh, in June, we will have to deal with the 13 million that has already been lost through penalties uh, for last year and non-compliance, and we will have to deal with the 87 million pounds that we are going to be penalised for non-movement on welfare reform for this year. So already, before we go in and try to meet bids, which I know there are many, which I know there are many which are urgent, many which are um, from departments who are in great need for that cash, we are already sitting with a situation of around 100 million pounds is uh, being taken from our budget because of non-compliance with welfare reform. And I think that there will be many departments who will be disappointed in the June monitoring round, um, but many of those departments will be departments headed up by ministers from a party who are ensuring that there is no progress on welfare reform, and therefore the, any failure to meet those bids from those departments will in effect be self-inflicted wounds. Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And could I just drill down into the process a little bit more? Which is primacy here in terms of distribution in, in June monitoring or in any other monitoring? Is it a government target or is it, the department, is it the department? And given the process that he's just outlined, isn't he in danger of spreading the butter so thinly? It neither satisfies the department ambition or the executive target. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that, that, that unfortunately, that's the reality of that's what the government is all about. It's about making choices. Um, we are making, we are being forced to make choices in a in increasingly difficult fiscal circumstances, which are not helped uh, by the fact, as I mentioned in response to Mr. Anderson, that we are shooting ourselves in the foot, so to speak, by not proceeding with welfare reform and are being um, forced to pay penalties that we shouldn't be paying. Um, so, you know, the the ability. The, what is being spread is going to have to be spread even thinner as we move forward, and we are already facing reductions coming through from, from Tory cuts uh, coming from, from Westminster as well. Um, in terms of what is prioritised or what, what comes forward, what, what, what priorities are met, I mean, there are a range of issues that um, we will have to look at, not least the overall picture of what resources are available. You could have, as we have had in the past, tens and tens and tens of millions of pounds worth of bids, but considerably less than that with which to meet them. So you are having to look at things like pr programme for government uh, targets and priorities. Uh, you're having to look at sometimes things which are inescapable in terms of legal requirements. So there are frequently bids, and, and the member will see this in the June monitoring paper as well, where bids have been already committed to in the past, or uh, legally we have to comply with certain things, so they have to be met over and above perhaps something that is even a programme for government target. But that's just the nature of the beast. We have less money than we need to pay for everything that we, that, that we want to pay for, so choices have to be made, and that's what governing is all about. Mr Robin Swan, quickly. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, he's already outlined the bids out, often out meet the supply and the money that's available. 
What steps does the Minister take to ensure that any bids that have been previously supplied, the monies are actually spent? Well, that, that is, Deputy Speaker, that's obviously monitored on an ongoing basis throughout the, the financial year and, and, and is ultimately dealt with within the uh, provisional outturn, which of course I'll come forward with in, uh, for last financial year in, in June, uh, late June, early July of, of, of this year. Um, and there is obviously there is ongoing uh, discussion and uh, correspondence back and forward between my department and other departments to make sure that money is being spent, is being spent where it is, and where pressures that have arisen within the year are being addressed through the allocations that have been made to them. Um, but uh, obviously, you know that sometimes departments don't always spend exactly what they anticipated that they would spend, and that's why at the end of the year sometimes you will see underspend within departments and. Thankfully, we have the budget exchange scheme in place, which allows us to roll forward expenditure into the sub uh, subsequent year. But it's not a sort of habit that I want departments to get into the way of doing, where they think they can just not spend the money on what they've been given to spend it on. And to be fair, I don't think that most departments will make bids that are erroneous in that respect. I think they will make bids for things that are genuine pressures, where there's genuine need, and they will spend it accordingly. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of the period for oral questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you again, Principal Deputy Speaker. I would ask the Minister um, when he expects the uh, budget for 2015-16 to be prepared. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have um, I wrote to whenever whenever the 2015-16 uh, national expenditure situation was uh, clear. Um, I wrote to executive colleagues outlining um, the process moving forward. Uh, during November and December of last year, my officials also undertook a um, a pre-consultation exercise with very, uh, some, a range of key external stakeholders, and this included uh, major business organisations, trade unions, voluntary and community sector representatives, as well as the Finance and Personnel Committee, of which the, the member is a member. Um, I aim to have a final budget in place by Christmas of this year, and that would necessitate a draft budget being agreed by the executive for consultation early in the autumn. I thank the Minister for that response. Minister, do you anticipate any changes to the programme for government uh, as a result of this budget exercise? Changes to the, the, the programme for government flowing from, from the budget. I mean, I, I, we're, we're in the, ostensibly the responsibility, prim, primarily the responsibility of the, the First and, and Deputy First Minister as I suppose, um, owners of the programme for government. Um, they will have to come forward with their recommendations as to what we do with it. We are, of course, in a situation where, having agreed a programme for government and indeed a budget, thinking that that would take us up to the end of this Assembly's mandate, the mandate has been extended by a year, uh, and that obviously poses a range of questions for, for the executive as a whole, um, both in terms of the budget, in terms of do we need to do radical surgery on, on the budget, and there may be many executive colleagues who think that's a good idea given the pressures that their departments are under, or others who might think that it's just an extension of um, spending patterns from the previous year might be the most sensible thing to do. It might be actually the easiest thing to agree, Deputy Speaker, in, in, given that it is only a year before the next Assembly elections, and then whatever spending review flows, flows after that. Um, in respect to the programme for government, um, similarly, I think that there will be many targets that will probably just follow through into and be extended into another year, uh, whereas there are others, I think, that given emerging needs and demands and issues will have to be added into that, um, uh, alongside the updating of other targets. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alec Easton. Thank you. Um, could I ask the Minister, is the Minister expecting a bid from the Health Minister for the June monitoring round? I have to say, I always expect bids from the, the, the Health Minister coming up to, to, to monitor rounds. I am aware, um, the member may be better aware and better placed than, than I am in respect of this, but I am aware of um, some media coverage in respect of the pressures that the Health Minister believes his budget to be under. Uh, and I would absolutely expect that, um, as in, in previous monitoring rounds, uh, the Minister will come forward with a, a range of bids to, to deal with those very real pressures that he faces. Mr Easton, for supplement. Could I thank the uh, Minister for his answer? Does the Minister uh, expect to be able to meet the bids uh, submitted by the Health Department? I, I would like to, to, to be able to meet the bids that the, the Minister is coming forward with. Um, I know that the, the, the Minister for Health has um, a department which is um, almost insatiable in its demand for, for resources, um, is under constant pressure. Uh, I think the fact that the, the current Minister has been endeavouring to 
drive out um, waste on, uh, from his uh, budget and has done so to the tune of several hundred millions over uh, the last number of years shows that the Minister is, is trying to do the right thing in terms of reducing cost within his own department. Nevertheless, pressure is constant and continual within that department. Um, I think my ability uh, as Finance Minister to recommend to the Executive that all of the bids, for example, or even a substantial chunk of those bids that are coming forward, be met in June monitoring is, is certainly hampered by the fact that other departments are coming forward with pressures. Uh, the envelope that we have in terms of available finances is less than we would like it to be. Uh, and we are, of course, as I mentioned before, facing the reality of penalties for welfare reform. And you know, I think it is a shame and it is indeed a disgrace that in a scenario where health, where justice, where education, where other departments are delivering frontline services that vulnerable people in Northern Ireland badly need are facing such pressure that we cannot address even in part some of those pressures because we are having to squander money by sending it back to Westminster because we can't move forward with welfare reform. Can I ask the Minister if he is in a position to update the Assembly on the Bill of Reductions process and the addendum on the business case for the Community Safety College at Desert Creek? I don't have the, um, the full um, detail in respect of the reduction in costs for that process. It, it is primarily, it's not, uh, I have to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, primarily a responsibility for my department. Procurement is being taken forward by the Department of Justice. Uh, they are the department who is, are heading up the procurement for this. Now, my department will, um, is involved in, in many respects, not least in terms of the financing and the, um, the continuing flexibility that we have received from. Westminster to, to finance this with um, some end-year flexibility, uh, but in terms of actual procurement, the cost of the project, the reductions in the cost of the project to try to ensure that the project still remains a reality are not uh, first and foremost a responsibility for my department. Michael Duff for a sub. Uh, obviously this project uh, offers major opportunities, significant opportunities in relation to employment, not least for the construction sector. Can I ask the Minister if he's concerned that it's taken too long to be finalised? Yeah. As I say, I'm not, I'm not responsible, and nor am I actually going to stand in, in judgment or be critical of other ministers or other departments for projects not moving forward. The member will be well aware, just as was um, raised with me by, by Mr Cree in respect to the likes of the A5, that big capital projects, particularly those of the sort of quantum of Desert Crete and of the A5 will habitually, unfortunately, because of their nature, the complexity of them, meet um, problems in terms of delivery. Um, and I, I regret that that, that happens and in those two cases has happened very close to one another um, and, so, and therefore creates the impression that it happens all too frequently. I think it's worth pointing out that annually we are spending well over a billion pounds in infrastructure and most of it goes ahead without any headache or any problem whatsoever. Uh, and in recognising the very real economic benefits, never mind the community safety benefits that the college brings forward, I think it is important that what outstanding issues there are are resolved and resolved very quickly so that we can either proceed with the project or we can, as Mr Cree was alluding to, if there is an issue with uh, funding or if there is an issue and the, the scheme cannot move forward in the time scale that was first envisaged and perhaps is delayed, that we have other projects that are equally valuable that we can spend the money on uh, as quickly as possible. I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Grumway, I'll get the preview last can call you. Would the Minister agree that the payroll problems experienced in the health service raises serious uh, questions to be addressed by the executive, as such IT and technical problems could affect any upgrading program for any department? Good. Uh, once again, it seems, it seems to be the day, Mr Deputy Speaker, for me being asked questions about everybody else's responsibility and, and not my own. I'm, I'm happy to come here any time and ask about my, or answer questions about my own responsibility. The issues in respect of payroll, and that isn't to denigrate the issues that are being affected or affecting staff within the health service, are very real. I understand that there are issues in terms of uh, HMRC and the uh, tax code and the emergency tax code that people were put on and the inaccuracies contained within that. Uh, I understand there are also issues in terms of the, the timeliness of the submission of information around, for example, overtime by members of staff. Uh, my department is not responsible for payroll services within the Department of Health. We are, however, responsible through HR Connect for payroll services for the civil service and a few other agencies, so it's just, just uh, shy of about 30,000 members of our public service are actually responsible 
um, through, through my department. And at, at the present time, payroll accuracy within HR Connect is at a monthly basis at 99.9%. So it's almost as, as good as it can get in terms of ensuring that there's payroll accuracy for those some 30,000 uh, public services, servants who are my responsibility in, in terms of their pay. I want to thank the Minister for his answer, even though it does go, as he says, beyond his own remit. Could I ask him if all departments have de deployed the same uh, software? No, no, they're not, and, and, and this is a very good example of where it's not the case where health are, are um, for their I think, 70 to, 70 to 80,000 employees using uh, a different system. Um, I would encourage um, all departments who uh, aren't con or, or whose bodies or agencies or arm's length bodies aren't actually using HR Connect, given the fact that it is successful, given the fact that it is paying at a 99.9 per cent accuracy rate, uh, given that there is, I understand, spare capacity within that system, or it could at least be built onto the existing system, to, to very seriously look at HR Connect as an option for them in terms of shared services to, to roll their uh, payroll into, um, because it would ensure not only, um, given current performance, accuracy in delivery of pay and, and, uh, to, to individual members of staff, but it also will help to reduce costs, because the more individuals who are getting paid using HR Connect, then the, re the bigger the reduction there is in terms of each unit cost for each person moving forward. So I think it's, it's something that I have tried to encourage all departments to look at. It's something I've been in discussion with the Minister of the Environment on in terms of the possibility of using it in time for our new councils as they look to realise savings um, as a result of the RPA. So there is huge scope uh, for HR Connect to be expanded, as indeed there is for, I think, quite a few of our shared services which are quite successful within, within Stormont. And I call Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, last week I asked your ministerial colleague, uh, the Deputy Minister, uh, would she follow the example of the DOE Minister and relocate jobs to Coleraine in order to mitigate the impact of the disastrous uh, DVA decision? Uh, she gave a very disappointing response, saying that she would look at that in the context of local government reorganisation. It will be far too late for the DVA workers. Are you prepared to follow the example of your ministerial colleague in DOE and relocate jobs to Coleraine? The member will be well aware that the Minister of the Environment and I have been working very closely on this issue. Uh, he and I took on responsibility to bring forward a paper to the executive, which indeed we have brought forward to uh, the executive in the last number of weeks. Looking at this issue, I welcome um, what his party colleague, my executive colleague, Mr. Durgan, has done in respect of relocating uh, jobs from within DOE to Coleraine. That is, of course, as, as the minister uh, primarily responsible for this, these staff, it is uh, first and foremost his responsibility to do that. I know that other departments have been looking at, uh, actively looking at, and that was the whole emphasis of the paper that was circulated around executive colleagues, uh, Deputy Speaker, to look at existing opportunities or opportunities that may exist within their department to redeploy staff to Coleraine, and indeed not just Coleraine, but the other affected areas uh, within Northern Ireland. Uh, and the member will appreciate from his time in, in government that it isn't always as easy to do that in the sort of time that we uh, have in respect of this issue, because time is, is marching on with the end of the uh, existing work coming up in the, in the summer. I have confidence and faith that executive colleagues are doing their best uh, at looking at relocating staff, but it isn't always as easy as the member might wish that it was, and, and he will know from his time in government, uh, having not moved a substantial amount of jobs out of Belfast to anywhere else, um, that it isn't as simple and straightforward. I think the record shows that when I was a minister, both in moving jobs to Derry for social security purposes, for, a car, or for um, the uh, carrier bag, and for other reasons, I did relocate jobs out of Belfast. But the issue is that last week, your ministerial colleague, the Enterprise Minister, chided other ministers where the, those ministers were responsible for large volumes of staff in their departments. Your department, when you gather together all your staff, is over 3,000 members of staff. Why are you not able today, given the paper that you have been working on with Mr Durkin, why are you not able to say today that you will re relocate 50 or 100 or 150 of the 3,000 jobs that fall to your responsibility? Well, 
very simply, uh, Sir Deputy Speaker, a, a substantial number of the staff that are under my responsibility in the Department uh, of Finance and Personnel are not at the grades that are affected in Coleraine, and the member will know full well that the majority of the grades affected are AA and AO level. A substantial number, in fact, the uh, larger percentage of my staff are not at that grade. So it's not you cannot move a job that is not, you know, a job at a different grade to. Coleraine to take up the, the slack in Coleraine if there are AAs and AOs there. So it's not as simple and as straightforward as the member thinks that it is. Uh, I commend the Minister of the Environment on what he has done to date. It is primarily, as I said, his responsibility as a minister responsible to address this first and foremost. Uh, I will be continuing to encourage other ministers who have larger complements of staff to similarly do so. But I think we have all got to appreciate and understand that it is not an easy matter to do in the sort of short time scale that is available to us in respect to the DVA jobs in Korean. Order and time is up.